Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, a real joy to see so many of you showing up this afternoon. Uh, my name is Alistair Mackay. I'm the Director of Reconciliation Initiatives. Um, this is the first of our uh, webinars in 2002, uh, a, a series jointly sponsored by HeartEdge, um, who are hosting us uh, today. Um, I'm going to suggest we begin by I'm not sure what sort of a day you've had, how manic or not it's been, but let's take a moment just to be still, to be quiet, to remind ourselves of God's presence. And then after a time of silence, I will, uh, I will pray for us. So maybe find a comfortable upright position for yourself, take one or two deeper breaths and we'll be still. Gracious and glorious God, we bless you for your love for us, for your love shown in your neighbourliness uh, to us, your creatures. Grant that as we reflect on being better neighbours today, you may be inspired by your spirit and prompted to see more of your ways of love in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Great. Well, I am uh, joined today uh, by three of our four planned uh, speakers. Um, unfortunately, Ellen Loudon, who's the Director of Social Justice and Canon Chancellor in Liverpool Diocese, is, is unwell and not able to join us uh, this afternoon. Um, but I'm sure um, you're going to enjoy a rich conversation as we listen particularly to Al Barrett, um, to uh, Karen, Karen Lund and to Tom Wilson. Um, and let me have e each of them uh, sort of introduce themselves briefly. So, uh, Al, do you want to kick off for us? Thanks, Alistair. My name's Al. I am Rector of Hutchill Church on the east side of Birmingham. Uh, and I recently wrote a book with a colleague, Ruth Harley, called Being Interrupted. Great. Thanks so much, Al. Um, and Karen, let's, hear, let's have you introduce yourself. Hello everyone, um, I'm Karen Lund, I'm in Manchester, I'm here as uh, Archdeacon of Manchester, though um, began ministry down, down south, I've been here since 2017. Great, thanks Karen. And Tom? Hi, good afternoon, uh, I guess I'm in the middle uh, in Leicester, I'm Director of the St Philip Centre uh, Christian Foundation Interfaith Training and Resourcing Centre. Great, thanks so much. Well, let me just say a few words about the focus of this afternoon's webinar. Um, we're focusing on the question, what does it look like for Christians in our churches to be better neighbours to those in our local communities? So about uh, being better neighbours, I hope that's what you're kind of ex expecting and think you've signed up for uh, this afternoon. And so I'm expecting that, among other things, we'll explore how churches might shift from seeing ourselves as the sort of benefactors of our local communities to being potentially companions, collaborative hosts, and even recipients of neighbourly love from our neighbours. Uh, for me, at the heart of this is recognising that the Holy Spirit can work through our neighbours as much as through anyone who might be a sort of confessing Christian. And so, therefore to notice that there's actually always a two-way blessing in our relationship uh, with our neighbours. But we'll see what our, our speakers have got to say. They may have some, some different perspectives on some of that. Um, so uh, what I've got as a first question for our speakers is a, is a fairly basic one as I, as I look at it. And it's this, what do you think have been the prevailing paradigm of recent decades in relation to the church's missional engagement with our local communities and what's one way that this may need to shift to better fit our current context so um al i think you were going to sort of kick off on this one thanks alistair um i'm hesitant to to try and do anything as grand as describing what the prevailing paradigm is but I think one of the things that I would want to point to is uh, what I would want to call the dominant economies that shape our missional imagination, um, the kind of the ways we imagine the world that we inhabit and 
and what that does to what we care about, what we value, um, what shapes our thinking and talking and decision making and, and acting. Um, and I think I'd want to point to two kinds of economy that seem to be shaping, uh, particularly the church that I know best, the Church of England, uh, at the moment. Uh, one we might call the economy of counting in, where we look for the things that we can measure, that we can count, and particularly the things that seem to come into our building or into our church community. And primarily they tend to be money and people. And so there's an anxiety, I think, underneath that economy that's about saying we're counting these things in, but actually there's a hole, there's a lack. There's a gaping chasm maybe at the heart of church that needs filling. We need money, we need more people, otherwise something terrible is going to happen. And I guess the something terrible is that maybe the institution or church won't be around in 10 years time, 20 years time, whatever. So that's one economy. I think the second economy I would, I would call the economy of giving out. And equally, this seems to be at worst driven by a lack, driven by an anxiety, um, an anxiety at the at the heart of our communities, we're worried that our communities need something, uh, whether that's because they are living in poverty, whether that's because they haven't heard the gospel or whatever. And, and we think that we as church can, um, can provide that thing that our communities lack. And so both of those economies, I think, shape the way we act, shape the way we think about mission, shape the way we look at our neighbours. We either look at our neighbours as kind of potential pew fodder or potential givers to the church to help us survive, or we see them as, as lacking something, as needing something that we have to offer. And so the shift that I would suggest we need to, to kind of venture into is to find ways of letting go of that deep-rooted anxiety letting go of that perception of lack and, and the sense that lack is what drives the way we think and the way we do, uh, and embrace the possibility, as you said, that the Spirit of God could be alive and present in the midst of our communities in ways that, that if we look for it, we might discover abundance there in the midst of the fragility and the struggle and the smallness and the, the encounters. Thanks, so and I think so. Really striking that your 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 sense is actually the church is quite often driven by a sort of dual anxiety, both about its own survival, and that gets focused on obsession with numbers and how many people, how much money we've got, um, but also an anxiety of you know, or there are needs out there that we should we should be the ones to meet, and so there's a sh a shift needed in and a moving out of that place of anxiety into a place, a place of sort of greater trust. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's turn to uh, Tom. Let's, let's hear your sense of what you see as something of the prevailing paradigm and uh, one way that it might need shift. Thanks, Alistair. I mean, I guess I'm gonna approach this particularly from the perspective of presence and engagement, which is the Church of England's program for building relationships with different faith and belief communities. Um, and if I think about, I mean, the name kind of gives it away slightly, but kind of historically, it struck me that that's been very much about doing to people this kind of understanding of well, here we are, we are the national church, we are the ones, you know, the gatekeepers, the power brokers, the ones who can speak on behalf of other faith communities. I mean, I think it's often done out of a desire to be helpful and supportive, but occasionally it can just come across as a bit um, imperialistic or kind of pretentious, you know, I as the bishop can speak on behalf of everybody, well, that may or may not be true. Uh, and I think, you know, as some of these groups maybe have become a bit more established, more confident in their own identity, uh, more able to maybe more better resourced and so on and so forth. Um, we need to shift to much more working with people or even receiving from people. Uh, I mean, picking up uh, some of Al's comments, I was thinking about uh, the church that's next door to our centre, so St Philip's Church, uh, had a break-in a few years ago. It's a relatively small congregation. The place this often is after a break-in was a complete mess. Um, so it was the mosque over the road that sent a whole group of their young people to come and tidy up. And that was just because they were being good neighbours and they knew that uh, their local church effectively had been broken into and they wanted to put it right. Uh, and that didn't bother anybody, particularly if it was quite normal. Um, 
but I think for some people that's maybe a bit scary and unnerving and they think oh what should we do back and the mosque wouldn't expect anything back particularly yeah. fantastic Tom and I think what's striking there I mean you haven't you didn't mention the fact that you know historically the church has often used those of other faiths as people we must convert to become Christians um, <laughs> and um, not that you're saying I, I'm hearing you saying we shouldn't be open and honest about our faith but rather than primarily viewing people as sort of conversion fodder um, you know slightly different to Al's pew fodder uh, seeing that actually um, there's a shift to viewing those of other faith as people we need to build a relationship with and who may actually have things to offer and to teach us um, and, and things that really can surprise us in terms of discovering things about God and God's way of working in the world. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, then let's come to you, Karen. Thank you, Alistair. So es essentially we're thinking about um, cross-cultural mission. And um, I think like Al said at the beginning, I've not looked at any sort of data or, or stats, but certainly one of the, um, by way of example, one of a, a good example of, of what we have been doing in the past and, and some of the prevailing paradigms is exemplified through um, Donovan. I don't know whether some of you are, are aware, and I'm speaking out of the context of, of a Church of England context, um, who shared his memoirs in Christianity Rediscovered. Um, and he realised that the social gospel um, in the Roman Catholic Church was providing hospitals in, in Tanzania and doing absolutely fantastic work. But he decided that um, he wanted to take really seriously the, the Great Commission. And I think that's where some of our paradigms have emerged. The Great Commission to go out and to proclaim and to baptise and to make disciples. Um, and I think the way in which we've done that and the way in which um, Donovan shares his um, memoirs is in a very disembodied way. Um, so we have very literally done the proclamation, which, of course, is part of um, our, our faith and, and discipleship and part of mission. Um, but it's been disembodied and we've not turned up with ourselves. And so the way in which, again, that has been exemplified at the local level, local communities, um, has been, if you like, almost... Um, an exertion of power and, and, and not in an aggressive way but you know again in the Church of England you're the established church we've done it because we've been able to, to host because we've just literally details like you know having buildings where we've been able to host but that has meant that perhaps our our listening um, uh, and our obedience actually to the gospel and, and the roots of obedience is actually about listening um, has been thwarted um, and we've not we've not taken a great deal of care and also we have perhaps become more proficient in in giving rather than receiving so we've got something to offer everyone else in our community um, but failing and not recognizing and, and not receiving the blessing of what others can can share with us and Donovan it, it, as I say in his memoirs in Christianity rediscovered discovered that actually um, we needed to turn up as ourselves um, it wasn't just a social gospel that we were um, uh, asked to 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 uh, tell but actually to live out um, the, the faith and to engage and so I think um, one way that might be helpful in helping us move towards a shift is understanding something about um, cultural intelligence and this whole concept of kind of core and flex um, because I think one of the concerns that we have is that if we stop the proclamation stuff which we're not wanting to do we're trying to reshift uh, uh, make a shift and refocus is that we lose the you know what we hold so dear and precious um, but cultural intelligence speaks about holding what is dear to you what's your in your core um, but being flexible enough to to hear and listen and share and um and, and share those things together with with within the communities with our our partners um so that's i would say then that becomes more of a a, a rebalancing of power hmm. and i think with that what i'm hearing karen is is a sense that actually mission needs to be more dialogical um, uh, about a dialogue with others um, and that you know uh, the essence of of dialogue is that we are listening <laughs> to and engage with and hearing others and more respectful of others and that's that's sort of part of the shift that 
uh, you're, you're seeing a need for compared with where, where maybe the church has been at historically. Um, okay, well, what, let's see what, if anything there, I, any of you would like, the, the, the three of you would like to pick up on what others have shared. There are a number of things where I saw some commonalities, but there might be also some things you want to uh, sort of tease out. So who'd like to sort of either respond to or pick up on what one of the others uh, has said? I thought um, it was uh, helpful what you shared with us, Al. I wondered whether um, another economy perhaps is, is the economy of consumerism. So people come in to buy inverted commas, the baptism, the wedding, um, but, but not actually participating and whether that's another e economy that you've, you've considered um, alongside your others. That's a really helpful thought, Karen. And certainly when, when Ruth and I in our book describe um, the economy of giving out, uh, one of the images we use is the, the three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. And we talk about the temptations to, to the power of the provider, the power of the performer and the power of the possessor. Um, and I think, you know, one, one obvious way in which that second economy is, is illustrated is through something like a food bank where you know, we, we, the church, are so often on the sort of providing end and we provide someone with a food parcel and they go away and then, you know, we wait for them to come back next week and we provide them with another food parcel and so on. But I think equally, like you say, I think, you know, our, our wider economy of consumerism can seduce us into the power of the performer, imagining that, you know, we've, we've got to put on a show. Uh, and if we put on a better show than the people down the road, then, then people will come and consume our our product rather than theirs and I think that can be that can be really quite a destructive temptation as well and obviously it reduces our neighbours to like you say to consumers uh, that don't necessarily come with anything to to contribute um, and I, I love those much more embodied images that you pointed towards of for example the, the meal table where where everyone shows up with with something to bring to the feast Fantastic, thanks, Sal. And Karen, was there any was there any aspect of of that kind of more consumerist culture that you think impacts how the church engages in its missional in, engagement with with local communities, or or that kind of yeah, what the implications of that are for our, our missional engagement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first and foremost, I think it's um, an assumption um that that's what our communities are, are looking for um and there's almost i think sometimes a palpable sense you know where's where's the more where where's where's the other um is is there something that that comes with this and that's where we've that's where we've struggled um and we we perhaps become less courageous um in being more explicit um about uh faith um, and, and using and living out words like like love. Um, so, so it's more, I think the consumer consumerist thing is more contractual or can appear very contractual. Um, and we don't get the opportunities or perhaps not courageous enough or, you know, sort of just not get got ourselves organized missionally to to demonstrate those other aspects. Um, and then there's a shift, I think, from power. Um, about uh, from from doing power that is doing to power that allows us to be more vulnerable um, and demonstrating some of our uh, our weaknesses where there is also power but it's shared and offered in a very different way. Mm. Yeah and so my sense of part of what I'm hearing there is, is that one of the things that may need to shift for those of us in the church is actually how we perceive our neighbours and rather than seeing them as consumers even if they might see themselves as consumers is actually this is about a relationship that needs building and about um, a mutuality that needs developing um, and that that's 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 quite an important shift in the sense of how we how we engage I think what you're talking about power there seems really significant in terms of some of what you were sharing, Tom. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering how you see the power dynamics, um, the interfaith power dynamics in the in the um, in the, the British context. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about things like the fact that we have bishops in the House of Lords, but we don't have 
uh, the faith leaders of other faiths represented in our kind of parliamentary system in the same way. What, what are your reflections on some of that, Tom? I, I think on the structural things, I guess that's partly because the Church of England is a hierarchical organisation and you know, the church, therefore the church can make decisions about who it's going to put forward. If you said to I don't know, the Hindu community, um, who are your great leaders, then there'd probably be an awful lot of individuals who would say, well, it's me. Um, whether anyone else in that community agreed with them or not would be you know, a separate point. And I'm really glad it would not be me making decisions around that. Um, but the other thing I guess I was thinking when you were talking before about learning from some of our neighbours and visiting them, I always think it's quite good to go and make people get Christians to be the guests rather than the hosts, um, which is always quite fun uh, as they try and work out uh, how to cope when they aren't in charge, uh, particularly if they have to do things that are culturally unfamiliar, like take their shoes off, cover their heads, which for some people is very normal, other people really isn't. Um, and in particular, um, I do like taking groups of Christian ministers into a gudwara, um, particularly around lunchtime, so then when they get given a free vegetarian meal um, and they try and pay, and they get told, you know, in certain terms, please put your money away. That's, you know, that's not what this is about. And then we have a reflection on, you know, church hospitality and indifferent coffee and stale biscuits uh, and all of that kind of thing. Um, but it, I mean, if you take that a bit deeper, the Sikhs are also very confident in their own identity because they won't let you in if you don't cover your hair. And if you're under the influence of alcohol or drugs, they won't let you in. Um, that's, you know, they say, that's fine. You come back tomorrow when you're sober and we'll feed you then. But actually, here are our boundaries. We're very clear in our own identity. But within that, we will give you an awful lot. And I think that's quite a helpful thing for Christians to reflect on. Where are your boundaries? Where's the framework? And how generous are you prepared to be within that? Yeah. And, and I mean, what, what you're, I think you're pointing to there, Tom, is how much we actually may have to learn from our neighbours of other faith, um, how much they, they could be a rich resource in us actually reflecting more deeply on our own Christian discipleship and on what it means for us to be a genuine community uh, through the life of the church so that, that that's fantastic okay well thank you all very much that's been that's been rich so far what i want to do is just to sort of shift um shift on to a, a sort of further question um which is to try and reimagine a bit more what christian missional engagement for our neighbors today might actually look like so this is my sort of second um sort of big framing question in your imagination what does it look like for the church to be better neighbours uh, in the way we missionally engage with others? Um, Karen, would you be happy to kick off on this one? Yes, thanks, um, Alistair. I guess one of the, the key verses in my kind of reflection on this is um, the John 15, 15 one, where Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Um, and so at the heart, I think, for me, of one way of, of, of making a paradigm shift is, is relational. I think, I think for me, it has to be relational. Um, it has to be demonstrated and lived out amongst ourselves, because if we're going to make any attempt whatsoever to, um, uh, to, to, to make this work in our communities um, with our brothers and sisters of our own faith or, or other faiths, then we need to have sort of practiced and demonstrated it uh, amongst our, ourselves. And so that's a really key verse for me. Um, it also means that we have to uh, do some work in just looking again at our uh, values and our uh, priorities um, and so, for example, e even even I say underlying the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 um, talks about not judging um, what, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church. And that follows some a context of speaking about um, sexual immorality and greed and, and swindling and all that sort of stuff. And yet Paul says, um, you know, that, that's not for me to, to, to judge. And I think there's a sense in which we need to kind of just pull back, um, uh, look at our, our, our values again, um, and um, begin an, an, a new relationship, one that is, uh, that can be described as friends, which means we're going to be uh, mutually sharing of ourselves as well as our, our resources um, and, and, and willing to, to hear and, 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 and to listen. Um, so making a complete kind of shift from um, the doing um, to more of a relationship where um, 
we're allowed to be ourselves. I think that will be good for us as well as for, for others. Yeah. Authenticity, I think, is the word I'd want to use. And I, and I think what's, what's for me, is really striking in what, um, what you've offered there, Karen, is a sense that actually um, almost the first step in learning to be more missionally engaged with our local communities is actually an internal one of discovering a deeper level of friendship and of kind of sharing and of hospitality with one another. Um, so that actually what we are then sharing with others comes out of a, a deep, deeply shared life within the life of the church. Um, did, I, did I hear you right on that one? Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, it, it has to be uh, experiential. It has to be our own experience so that it is all authentic. Um, because otherwise, and, and I'm sure, you know, we've experienced this from time to time, um, those who were looking in or those actually that were engaging will 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 smell it um, and 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 see it so it can't really be anything other than authentic um love uh, mutuality of, of love and and friendship fantastic thank you karen um tom let's come to you next on this question um you know, in your imagination what does it look like for the church to be better neighbors Thanks, Alistair. I'm going to pick a particular example of Christian Jewish relations. I mean, there, there are lots of different bits of interface that we could pick up, but I, uh, as I, the more I've been engaged with that, I've realised I think this is one of the really important ones where Christians don't own their own history, mm -hmm. um, particularly the way uh, texts within the New Testament. I mean, I'm doing quite a lot of work reading and thinking a minute about Matthew 27, 25, where the crowd say, let his blood be upon us and our children. A verse that Christians down the centuries have used to you know, charge Jews with their side and justify the pogroms and so on and so forth. Uh, but also realizing that Christians have used uh, the Hebrew scriptures, use Isaiah, for example, as a means of saying, there you see, you know, you Jews are a stubborn, stiff necked people, therefore we're perfectly justified in killing you. Um, and Christians don't recognize this stuff, don't recognize their own complicity, uh, not maybe individually, but corporately. Um, and so I think it will be helpful for us to educate ourselves to an appropriate level. Um, the Jewish community is relatively small in this country, and I remember hearing a rabbi say to me, if we were to engage in dialogue, he would expect me as the Christian to be the listener first, because he's aware in part of this history, maybe not the detail of it, but enough that he feels he's got the right to speak before I do. Um, and I think Christians may not recognise that or understand why, um, and it would do us better if we did. And that's not to say we can't then have, you know, a robust conversation about who we think Jesus of Nazareth is. You know, I've had those conversations with, with Jewish friends, um, but you have it on the basis of having built a relationship in which you've acknowledged what people of your faith have done to people of theirs. Yes. Fantastic, Tom. So yes, yeah, so really highlighting that actually we are part of a Judeo-Christian tradition, not just a Christian tradition, that the, the Christian tradition only exists because of the Jews who've gone before us, and looking for some greater honesty in terms of the way Christians have handled that re the relationship with our Jewish neighbours down the centuries, um, and, you know, being part of uh, pretty appalling things in, in terms of uh, sort of Christian and, and Jewish relationship. Um, but yes, of, of a more humble approach uh, to our engagement with our, our Jewish neighbours uh, and of, um, you know, as, as Karen was highlighted, a sort of more dialogical, uh, dialogical one. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and now let's come to you on this question as well. So I think I want to pick up on that humility point um, in, in reimagining uh, how we as church can be better neighbours. Um, and I think that begins with with changing our changing our focus changing our location um so where where do we look in our communities i think we need to find what i call bumping spaces um and and tables that are not necessarily the ones that we control uh or the ones that we're familiar with uh picking up on points that uh, that we talked about earlier um, we need to shift from from being host to to being guest, um, but also to being stranger, to to enter into that experience of not being at home, um, and to 
to venture into spaces where actually we're we're well and truly out of our comfort zones um and to to live with that with that discomfort um and I think once we once we begin to find those other spaces and those other tables, um, the attitude of humility that I think we need to discover and deepen in those spaces is one of a radical openness to to the gifts and the challenges of our neighbours. Um, and gift is a word that suggests something that that we don't know what it's going to be beforehand. We can't predetermine what our neighbours are going to give us or what we're going to receive from them. We need to be open to be to be surprised, to to discover things as gifts that that we weren't expecting or that don't even look like gifts or feel like gifts at first glance. Yeah. Um, and so when we begin to be open to those gifts of our neighbours, we discover that actually some of those challenge us. Um, in the way that Tom and Karen have, have pointed us to already, actually some of those gifts might be really quite difficult for us to receive because they're questions around our own history, our own complicity with the powers that be, um, our own privilege perhaps, uh, sometimes in terms of class or race uh, or nationality. Um, but within that, if our eyes are are more well attuned to those kind of gifts that are abundant in our communities. We begin to see what we Christians would call the kingdom of God springing up all over the place. And I think one of the gifts that we have to offer back to our neighbours, uh, as Karen was saying earlier, is, is the gift of proclamation, but not in the sense of saying, you know, you need to listen to us because we're going to tell you what the kingdom of God looks like but in the much more humble sense of living alongside our neighbours and being able to point to something and just say, you know, that, that meal that we've all just shared together, that's, that's what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. Actually, it's, it's here, it's now, it's in this place, you've touched it and tasted it and felt it. And, and we Christians haven't been in charge of that. We haven't given that to you, it hasn't been our project, but actually we can point to something and say this, this is what our faith is about. This is what our faith looks for, what our faith seeks, what our faith seem, seeks to, um, to point to and nurture and, and encourage. And do you want to illustrate that maybe with, with, with something from your, your local context in, um, in, in Birmingham? Uh, sure. So one of the stories that I tell a lot um, is about our community nativity play. It's a tradition that, that we've, we've done for about seven or eight years now. Um, it's run by our local theatre group, uh, so it's not run by us as a church, but we're uh, kind of invited to, to partner with them every year to, to do it. Uh, we walk the streets of our neighbourhood and the grown-ups dress up in the silly costumes as well as the kids. Um, and, and one year the plan was to finish that nativity play at the church with uh, mince pies and mulled wine and, and hot drinks and, uh, and cake. Uh, and then there'd be carols for those who wanted to stay afterwards. Um, but the last but one stop on the journey was at the local chippy. Uh, and Sonny, who is a Muslim and runs the local chippy, uh, when we got there, he was playing King Herod, so he delivered his line. And then after that said, right, everybody into the shop, fish and chips, uh, come and stay and eat here. And of course that, you know, that totally changed the fun that we had for the evening. But actually, that abundance of generosity and hospitality, um, we we would have been stupid if we'd said no. Actually, we've we you know we've got a timetable here. We need to crack on. Uh, thanks, but but no thanks. So, just being to to having our plans changed by those those gifts of our neighbours and discovering abundance in spaces where where we'd not expected it. That's a lovely illustration now. And just to notice, unfortunately, I think we your your it looks like your internet connection might be a little bit wobbly because we lost one or two little bits there. Um, but I think I think got the essence of what uh, what what you're offering, which is actually um, seeing that there are gifts amongst our neighbours, gifts that may surprise us, may challenge us, may interrupt us, as the illustration you've just given, may throw us off from our plans, but actually could be really key to us being opened afresh to the life of God among us and to signs of the kingdom breaking forth among us. 
Um, let's give a chance now for any of you to pick up on what uh, has been offered by, by one of the others, either to ask a question or to kind of uh, build on top of something that's been offered or segue, segue from. Uh, what reflections do you want to pick up on from what's been shared by the others? So, um, sorry, Tom. Okay, shall I go? Go okay, um, Karen. So, yeah, just just picking up on this um, word um, hu humility, which is which is such a such a, a lovely word, and I think at the same time one that perhaps can be quite um, frightening, or, or or people can be a bit afraid of this kind of um, wrong uh, uh, understanding definition of, of 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 humility, where you know we remove ourselves from from the picture. Where, whereas I think a, a a true, as far as I'm aware, interpretation of of um, humility is actually about being able to turn up fully ourselves, but allowing others to turn up fully themselves as well. Um, and it, it does mean that we are going to then have to sit with um, with wrestling, um, unsurety, unknown elements. Um, and, and I think what Tom was 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 sharing as well, I, I found really helpful in terms of um, the bit about education. Um, and, and I think I want to sort of say that not only do we need to educate ourselves about our other faith communities in, in dialogue, but actually um, maybe there is um, maybe there is something to say about going back and re-educating ourselves, um, acknowledging that that maybe some of our theology has has been wrong and that we should be challenging our theology um, because if we're you know sort of traditionally um, and historically um, we haven't quite got there in terms of um, our objectives to to work in partnership and to do cross-cultural mission then it, 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 that that says to me that we need to kind of revisit with humility um uh, our you know our journey uh, and where we've come from in order to move forward with some intentionality um and kind of just reset the the strategy a bit if, if that's not an inappropriate word word to use uh, no, that's really that's that's lovely, Karen. And, and I I want to sort of um, you know pick up on on that in relation to some of what you were sharing, Tom. Um, so um, I did my curacy at St Martin in the Fields, and I know Sam Wells would have been uh, cheering on the sidelines as you were speaking, Tom, because one of the things that he challenged um, me as a curate was to um, always preach from the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament reading. We, we would have the lectionary readings, but you know his challenge was to, he said, because basically people have heard so much preach from the Gospels and from the New Testament, but actually the Gospel is all there in the Old Testament um, and helping um, helping our, our, our churches, our congregation members to, to kind of recognize how the Old Testament tradition really is key to uh, Christian discipleship and to understanding Jesus and to understanding uh, the gospel um, it, it is is kind of a responsibility for those of us who are Anglican clergy in, in our preaching but I I'd love to hear a bit more Tom on on yeah your, your thoughts on um, that sort of our relationship with our Jewish neighbors and um, uh, how we go about developing that and, and what what the implications are for the for the the Christian uh, missional challenge. I think I've got two initial thoughts and probably some other, other things could follow through. The first is um, I think it's great for a Christian to look at the Hebrew scriptures and go yep I can see Jesus in there so long as we're equally happy for a Jewish person to, to read it and go sorry where? <laughs> no 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 Isaiah 53 is very definitely about Israel as a nation it's not about an individual. Psalm 110 sorry about Jesus really? Are you sure? You know, Jimmy, just to have a complete, I mean, I guess for me, the best summary of it is, you know, the Messiah will bring in this uh, this messianic age of peace and love and harmony where there's no war or killing or, sorry, it, has that started? Do you know what I mean? So, to allow our Jewish brothers and sisters to go, nah, I can't see it at all, sorry, um, would be the first question. And then the second, so first point, sorry, and then the second one would be, uh, sometimes uh, we bring, uh, we do training for curates and ordinance and others, 
Um, and I'll bring a Jewish colleague in who kind of gives it to them with both barrels about the history of Christian antisemitism. Um, but he says to them very much, this is a conversation for us as theologically educated leaders. And we can, you know, we can have a robust conversation in this context where we kind of know where we're coming from and know what's going on. Um, if I was to take one of my other Jewish friends into a church community for her to talk about her experiences of Passover, that's a different conversation at a different level. And we need to kind of work out who we're talking to and what we're doing and what's the point of the engagement. Because at the local level, or when I bring a uh, you know, a friend in to talk about how Jews celebrate Passover today. I'm not trying to educate them as into what Jesus did then, because he, he didn't do what Jews do today, because Passover is celebrated now isn't what was celebrated then, certainly not with some of the additions from the progressive community. Um, we're just talking about, you know, as people of faith about how we live our faith out. And I think you'll learn a lot from that, but we just need to know what are we doing, how are we doing it, and recognising that as Christians we have appropriated other people's scriptures and made it mean what we think it means and it ain't what they think it means at all. Yeah I think that's that's a fantastic challenge Tom and I and I think it really that takes us back to the dialogical nature of what we're what we're exploring in terms of missional engagement which is actually we need to be prepared prepared to hear from our neighbours sorry no I don't get what you're what you're sharing I don't see how you draw that from the from the scriptures here's how I'm reading it which is a different way of, of engaging with this and, and by the way this is my tradition um, uh, but you know that that's a genuine dialogue we, we need to be prepared to hear things that could be really uncomfortable for us uh, and I think that's that uh, that's that's what one of the things I hear you uh, highlighting for us there um, Oh, was there any piece you wanted to pick up on that we haven't yet picked up on? Maybe, maybe a little bit, and it um, segues a, a little bit from, from Tom's point. Um, so most of my neighbours of other faiths are, are Muslim around me in Hodge Hill. Um, and a couple of years ago, in the middle of, of the first COVID lockdown, uh, some of us who are Christian locally were led in a day of fasting by our Muslim neighbours. Um, and we're helped through that day uh, with lots of encouraging WhatsApp messages uh, when we were complaining about our rumbling tummies uh, and our, our dry throats. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, a number of us uh, cooked bits of a meal and then dropped them on each other's doorsteps uh, so that we broke our fast together at the end of the day and we, we broke our fast uh, connected to each other via Zoom. Um, and our Muslim friends led the prayers uh, and spoke blessings over the food and over us at the end of the day and that was hugely powerful um, but that was entirely as Tom said at, at the level of neighbours you know the fact that I was the local vicar uh, really wasn't relevant in any of this this wasn't one of those sort of interfaith gatherings between uh, males with important titles in their respective communities it was it was a gathering of neighbours most of whom are women uh, which in my experience of interfaith engagement has has been mostly the case that actually at the grassroots level it's it's mostly been women from different faiths just doing stuff together and being good neighbours to each other that has um, has been the most profound and significant um, interfaith engagement. Um, and I think that that led me um, to just think about Karen's point about values earlier. Um, one of the things that we've discovered here over the years is that um, values can sometimes be the common ground that we discover with our neighbours uh, on which we do stuff together uh, and in which we we get to know each other better and deepen those friendships and actually what we've discovered about values here is that when we as Christians begin to articulate things about God uh, the, the God that we know as Christians, uh, we discover that also actually we see those values in our neighbours of other faiths and of none. Um, they're also values that we want to reflect in our own lives as Christians, but also they become, uh, like I say, the, the kind of the shared soil on, in, in which we can actually do stuff together. And so a few years ago, we articulated values of compassion, generosity, trust, friendship and hope as values, you know, first and foremost, that we saw in God, but also that we recognised in our neighbours around us. And maybe they were clues to seeing the Holy Spirit present and at work in our neighbours of, of other faiths and of none. Mm. 
Thank you, Al. Yes, and, and I think um, the significance of female voice in this is obviously quite interesting in terms of the dynamics amongst us this morning, because obviously we're without, uh, this afternoon, we're without Ellen, so we've got, a, so far we have mostly three men and, and, and one female voice in Karen, and uh, we, we've not heard as many uh, as much sort of from a female perspective perhaps on this um, and so before we go to giving participants a chance to have a conversation in a, in a breakout room Karen I'm wondering if there's anything you'd want to sort of offer as a sort of uh, concluding response or comment from this this bit of the conversation. Thanks Alistair I, th I think um, what's coming to mind as I've listened to to the conversation is um, reminding ourselves that the gospel is not going to be sullied by engaging with um, culture or cultures plural, um, whether we're intentional about it or, or not. Um, and so, you know, reminding ourselves that this is a work that has begun in God and, and will continue and that it's us participating with what um, God has has started. Um, not the other way round. Um, so it does require us to kind of re reset the, the parameters here um, and to and to start again almost. And I think sometimes that means um, revisiting um, our, our theology, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but particularly for me, um, on, on perhaps, you know, from a gender perspective, the um, the theology of the Christian mystics, and particularly the, the, the women Christian mystics, I think have a, a great deal to offer um, and to say into this um, into this conversation and this this context. And is there a little illustration of that that you you'd like, you you could offer us on, from one of the mystics? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so many favourites, Julian of Norwich, but um, perhaps um, one. Uh, one quote I can give you, and I can't think of her name now. She's she's got um, it might come back to me in a moment. But the the her definition of um, that's really awful. I can't think. She's a huge. Uh, Don't favorite. worry, it'll, cut, it'll come to you in a minute. Um, it will. It will come. But her definition of of mysticism is is about an intuitive um, understanding, an intuitive experience. And I think what we have done historically in the church is is proclamation, 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 um, and not necessarily out of our experience. Um, and so therefore, um, going back to my earlier point, it, it hasn't been embodied, but not only that, is that that method of teaching has meant that others have um, uh, also uh, continued to um, progress the the Christian story using the same um, the, the same tools and the same resources and the same way of, of proclamation and so the Christian mystics um, would say actually um, Evelyn um, is the word I, I, Underhill is was the uh, mystic I was trying to think of would say absolutely it needs to be um, experiential it needs to be our experience and then it it really is authentic. Um, and a lot of the women mystics would um, sit in that space. Fantastic. I think that's a good note for us to sort of conclude this bit of the of the conversation. So thank you, Karen. Um, so uh, well done, everybody, for sort of uh, listening so attentively to what's been shared so far. I now want to give you an opportunity to have a conversation with one or two other participants in a, a breakout room. So mostly you will be in groups of three, um, although a few of you uh, might just being a pair. I'm not quite sure how the numbers are sort of stacking up at this point. But I'm going to give you um, nine minutes uh, for your conversation, which if there's three of you means you've got roughly three minutes to be contributing uh, between you. Uh, but two questions maybe just to, um, uh, to sort of focus your conversation. First of all, how do you respond to what you've heard from our speakers this morning? Um, and then secondly, what further question would you have for uh, one or any or all of them? Uh, that you'd like them to explore. So how do you respond to what you've heard and uh, what further question would you like to see them address? So um, my colleagues hopefully going to, uh, Debbie's going to post those in the chat so that you've got those questions to help focus your conversation in the breakout room. Um, and so make sure you give us a bit of space to hear from each person when you when you do get into the breakout room and hopefully Debbie um, is now ready to sort of uh, 
send you off into some uh, a small space to be in conversation with a couple of others. Obviously, you'll take yourselves off mute uh, when you get there. OK, look forward to seeing you in about nine minutes time. Great, welcome. Uh, welcome back. I think we're, we're hopefully all uh, rejoined us. Hope, it, hope it's been useful for you to have a chance to be in conversation with one or two others. I know there were one or two challenges and, and at least one or two of you didn't get a sort of full group to be in conversation with. Um, but if you have got a question that you would like uh, our speakers to address, then do feel free to type that into the chat at this point. Um, and we'll also give a chance for people to raise a hand uh, if you would prefer to sort of ask a question orally. Uh, but we want to um, pick up one of the questions that was already in the chat just before you went into the breakout groups. Karen, there was a question there that you noticed and thought would be an interesting one to respond to. Yes, thank you, Alistair. I, I was um, keen to share a few thoughts on what does success look like? Um, traditional mission um, has usually meant conversion um, and Edwards writes, but is success about the transformation of communities to reflect the values we see in Jesus or what? Um, so, so I was thinking that's an interesting word, success, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's not a Western concept, but I think for us in this part of the world, in, in, in the West, it's one we appreciate um, and, and enjoy winning, um, you know, maybe there as well in um, times of patriotism and, and even perhaps nationalism. Um, but from my perspective, if it's okay just to share sort of a personal um, reflection, as a UKME person, um, a lot of my experiences um, have been ones where I've had to wrestle and really fight to achieve success. And that would be true for, for other um, minority groups. And I think a more helpful word, word which, which Edward has, has used in the question is about transformation. And, and for me, transformation is something that, that, that's ongoing, um, evolving. And even if we think we've got there, um, we, we soon find you know, that there is more um, for us to, to, to look at, explore as individuals. And if it's true for us as individuals, then it's certainly going to be true um, in terms of our, our community. Um, and, and just perhaps an example from, from scripture where, where, where Jesus speaks about this whole concept of forgiveness. Again, if we're looking at this from the perspective of success, um, then we're going to kind of shortcut the process. Um, and I think in the process, damage individuals. Um, forgiveness needs to, to come from the individual anyway. Um, but I think often in the pulpit, you know, we've perhaps suggested that um, for success of, of a, a situation of, of, of conflict and to bring about reconciliation means we have to get there and we have to get there quite quite quickly whereas I think the Matthew 18 verse is um, you know where Jesus speaks about 70 times forgiving 70 times seven is is, is not the mathematics but it's about an ongoing um, forgiveness um, that that is in, in infinite infinite really um, and, and I think that's what I see as success in um, our, our discipleship and, and, and faith. Um, success is about having the ability and the intention and the um, willingness to keep, to keep going um, in, in all of the contexts and in all of the seasons. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. I th and I, for me, that, that seems, you know, and like seeing transformation as key there, really fits with certainly my own understanding of God's work within us individually, which is not to make us a success, but to make us more like Jesus, to transform us to be more like Jesus. But that, that also is true in terms of the communities of which we're part. It's not to see our local church as being more successful, but as being more faithful, um, um, more neighbourly, more engaged, with others in a way that kind of reflects God's neighbourliness and companionship of us. Um, so yeah, that's really helpful, thanks. Um, one of the other questions we had, uh, Al and Tom, was about um, our secular neighbours. We talked quite a bit about people of other faith, 
Um, and I wonder if, if either of you would like to offer an observation on in a highly secularized context, which is certainly true in the UK, I think is also true in North America, where some of our participants are, are based. Um, yeah, what, what, what might be the additional challenge there with our secular neighbors? I would, was thinking about my immediate context of you know, the, the houses around where I live and how we've built relationships there. So, some of that has been faith-based in the sense that at Christmas we'll give everybody a, a small Christmas gift and, you know, just say, nice to be your neighbours. Uh, I don't know if this happens in the North American context, but also in the UK, occasionally there are days that you can use for that, you know, like there was when there was the great get together a few years ago. Um, not necessarily everyone would have engaged with that, but we, um, and we had, a, we live in a cul-de-sac, so we had a cul-de-sac party, deliberately not saying come into our space, but you know, trying to allow people to have equal control, obviously it depends on where you live. Um, and just said to everybody, you know, whatever it was, two o'clock on Saturday afternoon, we're going to come outside uh, and have a cup of tea. And if you want to come outside and have a cup of tea and we can have a chat, that would be lovely. Uh, and the agenda was, let's have a cup of tea and have a chat. Um, because the, the other thing, and this has been taught me particularly by my friends of different faiths, but I think it applies to everybody. If your agenda is, I want to get to know you so I can convert you, the person you're talking to will know that, um, even if you don't say it, and therefore they will never talk to you. So if you can have the agenda of literally, I'm going to have a chat. I would really love to know who the person in number seven is. Um, let's have a cup of tea and we'll see what happens. Be very open to anything. For me, that will be the place to start. Find some kind of culturally appropriate excuse to meet in a neutral space and just go to see what happens. And, and for me, that connects in with what Karen was saying earlier in the conversation about authenticity. There has to be an authentic, genuine commitment to really nurturing a, a genuine relationship where I'm getting to know and understand someone who's different or who's a neighbour to me. Um, and that, it, that if I'm going with a, well, I've got to convert this person, that's going to be sniffed out very, very quickly. Um, Al, I noticed there was a question here that I thought, oh, that's right up Al Street, which is uh, from Richard Finch um, about how we do uh, how do we find bumping or table space in contexts such as new housing estates where the predominant context is individuality? Um, I don't think that's the only place where, where individuality is, is the case. Um, but uh, yeah, find, being creative in finding bumping and table spaces, I think that's something up your street. Would you like to respond to that one, Al? Yeah, and if, if I could just pick up on, on the last bit of conversation that we've had as well, I think one of the things that feels like it's a shared human longing is that longing for authentic community um, and how that is embodied you know it is manifold in its in its expressions uh, and faith communities know something about what authentic human community is about but I don't think any of us faith communities have a monopoly on that um, and certainly in our neighborhood we've found that that secular neighbors, discovering this sense of kind of being able to be real with other people who are not part of their own family um, but actually discover that people are interested in them want to listen to them and actually slowly as trust builds the possibility of sharing more deeply and also discovering that you can mess up and offend people and fall out with people uh, but uh, and that that community doesn't suddenly go away or the door isn't suddenly closed because of that. Um, you know, for many of our neighbours, that's been a massive discovery uh, and something that I think we as Christians would say was pretty close to the heart of, of, of our faith. Um, in more practical terms, one of the things that that we've discovered locally, um, and this links to one of the other questions about the pandemic and what we've learned through that as well, is that actually those bumping spaces often come down to as small a scale as your doorstep. So one of the things that happened is a team of what we call street connectors uh, go to different parts of our neighborhood each week and lit people's doors, not to sell them, uh, not to sell people something, not to invite people really, um, not to, not to offer something that that what and you need. A conversation of who are you? What's your story? What are you in? 
passionate about? Would you love to share with your neighbours? And we found that through the pandemic, particularly, even asking the question, how are you on the doorstep has often resulted in people kind of uh, in floods of tears or wanting a hug or whatever because actually that sense of connection has been so so missed uh, and is so needed um, and actually through those conversations neighbours who are next door to each other who maybe haven't talked to each other uh, over many years have discovered possibilities of doing stuff together like nurturing a shared garden for example or painting a fence together or whatever and that sense of connection has felt really important. Um, very briefly, the other thing that we found that worked locally is what we call street events or street parties. Um, and again, not us as church playing the role of host or initiator all the time, but if we can find a couple of people on a cul-de-sac or in a square that are up for being the hosts, we will support them to do the hosting and they turn out to be the best people to invite their neighbours out onto the streets to bring tables and chairs together, to bring kind of pots of tea and, and cake and whatever, um, to make a party that actually people learn the names of their neighbours that they've seen in the street a hundred times over the years, but maybe have never stopped to speak to before. And that, that becomes the starting point for a, a journey deeper. I, I mean, for me, that's really striking um, two sort of illustrations of, of, of that you've given there, Al. So certainly my own experience in where I live uh, locally in North London is a really powerful thing in terms of us being better neighbours to one another in our street has been an annual street party that we have, have held. It's not been organised by anybody who's got a Christian faith um, because we know the very few other people in the street who've got Christian faith. We've not been the prime movers in that but it has really built a sense of community in our street. And um, this is something that happened before the pandemic and has yet to happen since the pandemic, but we, you know, it's, it sort of got postponed, but hopefully this summer is gonna happen partly in conjunction with the, um, you know, the uh, Platinum Jubilee for the Queen. Um, but I, I, was, I was struck that, that I, we quite often have people knocking on our door and they normally want to sell us something or um, you know see if we need knives sharpened or some some other service like that and that it, it would be a counter cultural thing for us to be people who go knocking on the door just to see how our neighbors are that that would be a radically countercultural thing to happen um, because it just doesn't happen uh, at least in my experience here so I really like that illustration now Okay, well, let's see um, if there's uh, maybe a couple more questions from the group. Um, I don't know if there's anything I, any of you have, have noticed that's come up with a question in the chat. Um, there's, there's a recent one about rural. Uh, we, we noted that we were being very urban in our hmm. conversation. So I'm just noticing that I'm not, not sure if I'm the best qualified to answer. Um, so I will say, I think one of the things about a rural community, I guess it's true of small urban communities as well, which is that people tend to move slightly less, um, which makes the stakes slightly higher in terms of relationship building, which means you have to think of maybe a little bit more carefully about what you're doing and what the wider implications are. Also, when people who are you know, haven't lived in that area for seven generations move in, there are all kinds of opportunities there for learning and growth, but also, uh, it can be a very painful experience. You know, having talked with some friends and colleagues of other faith and um, belief backgrounds from, from different ethnicities who have moved into rural areas, they definitely have stories of how difficult that has been. Um, so I guess you know, it's another area to recognise that it can be tough. And, and my sense is also that one of the things that is different about the rural context is that the boundaries between sort of church and non-church um, can be much more blurred you know what the parish is who identifies with the church um you know many people can have a sense of actually this is our church even though they may never darken the doors of it even on christmas day um and so uh yeah that 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 provides a much more kind of um uh, blurry boundary between church and community um, is my sense from from talking with other folks who have ministered in a rural context. 
Um, Karen, was there was the one that um, you want that you've noticed in the chat that you want to pick up on, or, or I might just see if Jonathan's uh, noticed something that would be good for us to respond to. Yeah, I, I was um, interested in Ros's um, uh, comment about um, culture absolutely transcending um, all, all sorts of areas in in our life, but particularly the the shared trauma one. Um, and recalling um, just after the Manchester Arena bomb, speaking to a homeless person um, who was literally in the doorway on, on the morning after. And his concern was, was you know, what, how everybody else was. And perhaps that, you know, that, that shouldn't be su su surprising. Um, but it, it did take me take me back a bit, you know, in, in all of his own um, challenges and trauma, um, he was able to transcend all that um, and to kind of just connect on, on that sort of um, human level. And so it makes me, because um, you asked what other shared experiences, um, I, I, I think there are a lot more shared experiences. And I think the, um, the, the, the key, um, and the task is to teach ourselves um, uh, new learning again, and, and observing um, and, and looking at uh, looking out for those shared experiences, which which does kind of touch into the rural area as well. I think in the rural context, there are different things to observe and notice. And I hope this doesn't sound sort of a bit too romantic, but I think just in the kind of natural world of a rural area, which, which is there in urban areas as well, but, but in a particular and focused way. So it's observing and noticing and, and, and using that um, to help us in our mission. I think I think that model is there in, 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 in Jesus, you know, sort of using examples from just about any and everything to help uh you know listeners and hearers um understand something about that relationship with the divine and the relationship with each other mm. that, that's that's really helpful karen and for me and i say interestingly that that there's a sense of so what where do we look for the opportunities to build those shared experiences and you know actually the um you know the platinum platinum jubilee that's just coming up seems to me that is a, a golden opportunity to build some shared experiences to host a party in the street um uh to uh, form a, a sort of community memory of some kind um that actually could be really significant for building those relationships and that mutuality with our uh, with our neighbors Okay, how are we doing on time? Well, we've got, I think, time for at least one or two more uh, questions. Um, yeah, oh, so Sharon, you, you, you made the point I've just made. So I've, I, I'm sorry not to have credited you. I hadn't seen that, but uh, absolutely, I, 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 agree with, I agree with you on that. Um, hmm. Okay, I think Julie Winston's question is a really interesting one. Um, so, uh, which is about my immediate neighbours are not our church building neighbours. How does this conversation relate to individual church members living across a wide area? This is a really common phenomenon, I think, in the Church of England, especially maybe in, a, in, a, in an urban context where people commute into a church either because they've got a history of relationship with it or because it's offering a particular um, kind of flavour of worship that that sort of appeals to them. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested in in some observations from from any of the three of you on this. Al, go for it. Um, I mean, I guess one of the biblical images that that springs to mind is is that of salt or of yeast. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of what we've talked about today doesn't depend on large numbers or large concentrations of Christians in a in a neighborhood actually you know if, if you're the only member of your church in your neighborhood then you can still you can still make a difference you can still be a good neighbor you can still uh, be someone who through your attitude and your approach and your way of relating to others um, can can encourage community to build can grow trust and friendship uh, with those around you. But I think 
I, I do I do believe, and I think this transcends the the urban rural divide in some ways. I do believe that even in our our hyper technological world, there is something about physical neighbourhood and physical presence to each other um, that is is a huge gift uh, that we need to pay attention to and um, and commit to in one way or another. And I know that. Um, particularly people um, with uh, with disabilities of one kind or another, you know, sometimes that physical presence to each other can uh, can be more difficult. Um, but I think, as uh, I mean, Karen was reminding us earlier, that we're embodied beings, and that actually finding ways of of engaging in embodied relationship with others, um, whatever that means for us individually. Um, is profoundly important and um, profoundly of God. Hmm. And it says to me, Al, that that's something that really got highlighted through the course of the pandemic, um, that actually being attentive to those who are immediately around us and the neighbourhood within which we live is something that really came into focus through the lockdowns um, and through people actually being limited in where they could go. Um, you know, Prior to the pandemic, I was one of the few people who would go for a walk in lunchtime in our local neighbourhood because most of the people who work locally um, work in the West End or in the City of London. Um, now, because so many more people are working um, from home for at least part of the time, it's really unusual for me to go out for a walk in the middle of the day and not bump into somebody else. Uh, and I think that, so that's my sense is that's something that has changed perhaps permanently in terms of people's awareness of, of their sort of the locality and the localness uh, of, uh, of our neighbours and who our neighbours are. Well, this has been a really stimulating conversation. I think we need to be heading towards a close with it, um, but I want to um, give uh, each of uh, our, our, the visiting speakers a, uh, an opportunity to sort of offer some sort of concluding thoughts or reflections. It might be drawing some strands from what, uh, what's, what's come through the course of the conversation or an additional thing you want to offer. Um, Tom, can I come to you first? Yeah, I mean, I, so I've just been reading one of the questions and I would like to end with a reflection on that, which is Terry's question about practical ideas for shifting church culture. Uh, one observation, I think, uh, someone wearing a dog collar, um, is being really attentive to the individual power we have and the way we set a tone and expectation that the vicar does. I mean, I was really struck by this because I don't look after a church of my own. I, I often cover and I went to a church that had just gone into interregnum and this lady had worked really hard to organise the service, kept asking for my reassurance that it was OK. And I obviously did my best to reassure her, but I also slightly felt sad that she hadn't been given enough confidence that what they'd been doing every year, you know, every week for years was fine and I, there was no need to change any of it at all. Um, so just something about holding lightly to the power we have um, and being very open, I guess, to being surprised and letting God work where God wants to work. Mm. And, and helping to empower others and others feel more confident in the power that they do have um, and that it doesn't need clerical affirmation. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Um, Karen, can we, should we come to you next? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, my sort of final comments relate in some way to, to the... Um, the question from from Julie about the um, kind of diverse spread of of members of the church, um, and and so my comments are, are are this that to try and hold this as an expansionist project or an expansionist looking forward rather than sort of re re reductionist, and so and so Julie's question really reminds me that. It gives opportunity, even though members are living in such wide areas and apart from each other, it gives further opportunity for that, you know, the missional dialogue that we've been talking about in a way in which we offer ourselves in the best way that we, we can and receive from, from others as well. And secondly, I suppose it also stresses the... Um, the importance um, of, of really kind of getting to grips with this work and recognising, as we have done in the conversation, where 
you know, things are not quite where they should be historically and, and, and even now, um, so that the core members become, um, you know, live out that community, which I was touching on earlier, but also in their individual places when they're apart, that that story and that journey continues in those different places. Um, and so it becomes, you know, bigger and, and expands, which I, for, for, for me is, is one kind of definition and aspect of um, cross-cultural mission. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. That's, that's beautiful to hear. And then Al, some concluding thoughts from you. So I think one of the things we've not mentioned today is the global climate crisis. Um, and that feels like something uh, that both we need to acknowledge as a, a kind of overall frame of all of this, but also it, uh, it invites us into a particular way of being neighbours. Um, so I think uh, it, it reminds us to acknowledge our non-human neighbours as well as our human neighbours in all of this and, and what does it mean to be good neighbours or better neighbours with, with our non-human kin uh, and what does it mean to be interdependent with them. Um, it reminds us of the urgency of discovering ways of, of acting and living more locally uh, so that actually you know our world needs to shrink in terms of what we think of as, as realistic travel, uh, the ways in which we um, uh, kind of grow our food and, and the distance our food uh, takes to our table. Um, so actually working on local ecology uh, feels really important. And also it invites us into a, a common ground. Uh, it grounds us in, in the earth beneath our feet. Uh, and that, that root meaning of the word humility uh, in, in that in that humus um, and actually finding that as a space where actually we might encounter our neighbours in new ways and and deepen our interdependence on them uh, feels like both an urgent challenge but also a, a wonderful invitation at this time. Fantastic Alan and for me that's a great little segue just to flag up for you that our last a webinar at the end of last year which is available on Reconciliation Initiative's website uh, was about how the church can make a contribution to addressing the uh, environmental crisis so do have a look at that video uh, on our website uh, the, uh, uh, and the other webinars we had last year uh, and to let you know that this webinar will be available uh, to view um, in about a week or so on, on our website there uh, as well as on Heart Edge's um, uh, sort of uh, platforms. Um, so uh, if you'd like to draw to attention of someone, a friend or a colleague who wasn't able to get here, then um, it will be available, um, obviously without the breakout space for a conversation that you were able to join. So thank you so much, uh, each one of you for showing up today. And a special thank you to Al Barrett, Vicar of Hodge Hill in Birmingham, uh, Karen Lund, who's the uh, Archdeacon of Manchester and from Wilson, who's the director of St Philip's Centre in Leicester. Really appreciate uh, all that you've offered to us. It's been a rich, rich conversation. Um, Karen, I'm wondering if you would be willing just to draw us to a close uh, with a, a prayer and then we'll give a chance for people to say goodbye. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks. Holy God, we thank you for your immense love for us. We thank you for the way in which you have created such diversity and joy in that diversity of who we are and in the places in which we live. We give thanks for conversations, for listening, sharing, questioning. And we pray, Lord, that above all, you may help us to sharpen our um, listening to, to you, uh, to be obedient, um, to serve, uh, to receive, to be both host and guest. So we thank you for all that we've shared in this time and we pray that it may contribute in some way to the building of the kingdom in which Christ is King. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Karen.
Well, blessings on you. Go well with the rest of your day. Um, the speakers are going to stay behind for a little debrief, but uh, go well uh, and uh, lovely to have you with us uh, this afternoon.